last nine years, I've been helping academics move their therapeutics projects, uh, hopefully into reality, and that is my passion. So there is now a real overlap between what pharma used to do, what pharma does now, and the academic space, and that's what we're trying to deal with. To me, these are the key issues that you need to ask when you're thinking about, do I move from academia um, to uh, a startup? Um, is the product innovative? Is the science good quality? Um, is the product viable in the market? Are people, does it need, do you need it? Does it work against the competitors? The career choices of the individuals involved are really important because some people might want an academic career, some people might not, and you have to, you have to weigh up the two pros and cons of the two. Um, who owns the IP is a really good one. And I think, you know, Cathy's made it clear in the US and actually in the UK, which I know well, um, IP is pretty much owned, you know, by the universities. Um, and you have to negotiate that out um, if you want to start up um, using the methods Cathy said. So you, that's an important issue. Um, it'll cost money. That's an important issue. You need to create money. Where in this thing, in, in the development of your product, is the, the key funding point, the point where you can really start raising money into it? What data do you need? How do you get there? They're, the, to me, are the key issues that you're going to have to do. I think a tar target pro profile is the best thing you can learn about. It's the ultimate aim. Spending time creating a target product profile with, uh, for a product that you think is viable is a really important thing. I can remember you know, thinking about my products 10 years away in drug discovery. How can that be relevant? But boy, is it relevant. If you don't have an aim, you won't get there. Um, the target product profile is key. You have to create the data that fits that target product profile. This is what I call a target pro profile. You can put other things in it. You can move it around. And you can modify it as you go along. But it's the detail information of what a product has to look like. And you need lots of discussion with all of the, the key stakeholders, the customers. And remember, your customers are often pharma rather than patients. Um, you need to work out what you need to create, what sort of data that you need to support a product that looks like you've decided your product profile. Believe me, this is the one thing that I learned early on that makes a real difference. Create a product profile, have a clear aim, understand what that aim is and how to get there. So in terms of the therapeutics package, I think it's really important to think about the target validation package. And I'm very happy to discuss outside what I mean by that. Having a target validation package that Pharma, your probable customer as a startup, actually believes is a robust target validation package is a really important thing. Think about the, what safety data you can have. Have you got a compound? Have you actually got any optimization of that compound so that it looks something like a candidate drug? And where are the patents mm -hmm. along this way? They're the decisions you need to make to make your decisions. Similar decisions for devices and, and diagnostics as well. Um, and um, I'm going to charge through this. So when you think about when do I leave academia, I honestly think you need to think. Money is the, is the key issue here and your, your career goals. If product development is expensive, whatever area you're in, um, and it's tough to fund it in academia, you might get grants. There are some, and it's well worth it because a lot of them are non-dilutive, which is pretty valuable money for you. Uh, but the resources and expertise aren't all there, so you have to get them from somewhere else. And you can get them from somewhere else. Virtual drug discovery is a reality now, without doubt, but it costs money. If you can de-risk your asset more in the academic sector, especially if you don't own the IP of it, then before you move into the startup phase and you have to go and get real money, that's my biggest advice for you. But it does depend what your goals are and if, and if the IP is owned by the university or by yourself. I'm going to leave it there. And now I want to talk about the business side. So you need to bridge from, uh, from technology, for, in our case science and, and clinical, into business. And if you can't make that bridge, you have a lot of problems. So this is Reid Hoffman's uh, quoting, startups throw yourself off a cliff and assemble an airplane on the way down. Um, we don't want you to do that. 
So why do startups fail? And we all know the reality is, you know, 90% of startups fail. It's because they make products no one wants. And this comes from actually an article in Forbes um, talking about, you know, what, how that happens. And, and so we recognized that this was a problem, as did the National Science Foundation, who funds a lot of startups. And they found something called Lean Launchpad. They found it actually at Stanford and Berkeley, a guy named Steve Blank. How many of you have heard of Lean Launchpad? Yeah, okay, so I probably don't need to say too much about it. Nick Conley has taken Lean Launchpad at UCSF. Um, so this is a framework where you're gonna test the business side, your value proposition, whether you have product market fit. And we created the life science version of this. So what Lean Launchpad says is we now know how to increase your chances of developing a commercially viable product. And that's pretty cool, right? It actually can be done. Um, and it's all about going out there and talking to stakeholders or customers as in the lingo of Lean Launchpad. So in 10 weeks, what Lean Launchpad does was they force every team out, out of the lab, out of the clinic, go talk to real customers, stakeholders. And, and every week uh, for the 10 weeks, you have to come back and report on the interviews you did. And in very many ways, this simulates a startup. So it puts a lot of pressure on you. There's all this uncertainty about what you're finding. Um, we want you to learn quickly and to pivot. If you're not getting any product market traction, any fit, then do something different um, and go outside of your comfort zone and, and so on. So this is called the business model canvas and it hits sort of all the major pieces of what goes into a business model all on one, one page. And the point is when you start, have a startup, you're just guessing about all these things. You really don't know who your customers are or who, um, who, what the channels are, what the, what the market is. And as you go along each week, you're testing these hypotheses in every part of this canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you don't get the product market fit right, then you have to go back and sort of re-examine what do we have here? What are we hearing from the marketplace? And how should we pivot to, um, to have something that has real traction? And so this is a, a weekly, you update your canvas, you stand up and, and present to the teaching team who challenges you and says, well, what did you do? What did you learn? And what are you going to do next? Um, and you, you end up pivoting. So yesterday I was at an NSF i uh, national final session and I, the teams got up and many of them said, you know, uh, we, we, could, we were wrong, we thought this. In fact, they all said that. We thought this in the beginning, we went out, we talked to people, we found out something completely different and now we're doing this other thing. And some of them said, we're, we're not gonna continue because we never found product market fit. So at the end of the day, we, we say, you know, saying that there's no fit here is a win because you're not wasting time and resource on something that's never gonna have traction out in the marketplace. And some of these teams yesterday said, you know, we never found this fit and um, we could have wasted the next two years building our thing and then finding out we never had any fit and this was a way better way to do it. So, um, so this is a very powerful technique. It's called Lean Launchpad. It's taught around the United States and um, wherever you are, I encourage you to see if you can find a, a way to get into this program and test your value proposition and make sure that you've got the right business, um, the right business focus. So thank you. So I think uh, the compliment to the idea about finding the right customer is to uh, eliminate technical risk as efficiently as possible. And so it's 40 years ago that the biotech industry was given birth. And interestingly, when uh, Bob Swanson, who was 28 at the time, went to Tom Perkins and asked for $2 million in capital to launch Genentech, Tom laughed at him and gave him $200,000. And so what he did was he rented the corner of a warehouse in South San Francisco, hired a lanky postdoc, and set up shop. The other thing that was really interesting is he co-opted the laboratory, Herb's Laboratory, to take NIH funds to help reduce that risk, something that caused a furor at the time. I think it's more tolerant today. There's more tolerance for that today. But it's also a critical piece of lowering technical risk efficiently. That, of course, became a wildly successful company, went public in four years, a product on the market in six years, and it produced a land rush. And so from then on, for the next 20 years, everyone with an idea got in, in the Bay Area, got in their car, drove to Sand Hill Road, expecting to come home with piles of cash. 
And that produced a different model. That produced a model where you raised five or ten million dollars, and you went out and you rented beautiful laboratory space, and you hired 20 people, and off you were to the races. Unfortunately, that produced a lot of companies that didn't produce returns for the investors, and we hit a very bleak period in the venture industry in the 2000s. And so uh, the other liability of that five to $10 million raise was that almost all of the companies that tried failed to get that capital. And they were in this vicious catch-22. They needed money to get data, and they needed data to get money, and they couldn't extricate themselves from that vicious cycle. So we took a page from Genentech and said, well, what if we go back to a, a really modest beginning, take the zero off whatever it is you need, take six months off that process, and just turn technical folks into risk reducers in a company context. So an important idea, which we're, we're also investors, which I rarely see in investments, is a notion of where your inflection points, where your real technical risks lie. I think there's a basic assumption that you get money in, you work, and you produce value. And so there's some direct correlation between value on the y-axis and your input of time and money on the x-axis. And unfortunately, that's not true. What really happens is that you get money, and you're no more valuable than you were the day before. In fact, you're, there's a huge discount in publicly traded companies with cash without great products. That cash, they know you're going to spend, and they doubt you're going to return great value for it. So you get money in. You do something, and ideally, you cross some Rubicon to produce value for the company. Actually, the model is a little more interesting and complicated than that, which is your real value declines between those funding events, because you haven't reduced the key risk, and you now have less money than you did the day before. And so what you're hoping to do is reach those milestones as efficiently as possible. But I can tell you, I almost never see a pitch that identifies those. They say to me, I'm going to get an IND filing. An IND filing is not a risk-reducing moment. What percentage of projects fail to get an IND permission from the FDA? Successful phase one clinical data, yes, there's a, there's a risk-reducing moment. Raising money to do all the expensive IND filings doesn't really produce value for the company. So you need to know what those milestones are and then effectively get to them. And I, I just don't think people are thinking clearly about the singular risk. Then, of course, you raise money to get past that singular risk. And the other side of the equation is that you find some mechanism for uh, turning that into results as fast as possible. And so our incubators did this seven, eight, nine, nine years ago now by renting spaces the size of that table. And so if you break the expensive resource of laboratories down into microscopic aliquots, if you sell beluga caviar one egg at a time, it becomes affordable. And so that's exactly what we've done. It allows companies to get further on less. They get there faster as well. So I think the critical sort of thing we all have to do as an industry, and it's happening, we have to disaggregate the resources that are available to big companies and not to small companies. So outsourcing to China, incubators, our consultants are all part of that model. But then we have to effectively build the complement to the lean startup what Eric Ries talks about in terms of agile de development for software, we need the agile development for biotech. And I think that's what we're all working on. Thanks. We always tell people, you know, even though it's kind of painful to get it, go for grants. Uh, SBIR grants are a great source. And I say it's painful, it's competitive, and it takes a long time. But if you get it, you have now non-dilutive funding that you can use to hopefully get you to some sort of a milestone that investors will, will then say, yes, this is something that I could invest in. Um, there are sources of grants beyond the government. And, the, and if you feel like moving to, I think there's somebody here from Chile. Uh, if you feel like moving to Chile, you can spend six months in uh, Startup Chile and, and have them fund you. So you have to be really inventive. It's, it's really tough, and we all recognize it. Um, some people are lucky, and they get um, angel funding. We've had a number of groups come out of Lean Launchpad that have been able to raise angel funds because they have their, their business story together. Investors want to hear something different than we have this cool technology. They want to know what's the size of the opportunity and 
and, and who exactly is the market. And, and if, you're, if you know how to respond to those things, then you have a better chance of, of maybe getting some early funding. But admittedly, it's very difficult. And Doug, do you want to speak to that at all? Well, the other thing is uh, to lower the cost of getting there, right? So the incubators, but also if you can, um, if you can use collaborations with academic laboratories or industry, um, or if you can think creatively about how to uh, mitigate the costs. So there's a famous, there's a good story in getting to plan B that of course is not historically accurate, but it makes for a good story, that when they uh, built the iPod, the risk wasn't that people wanted to walk around with headphones or that people wanted to download music. Napster had shown, Sony had shown the headphones, Napster the downloads. The risk factor was would they pay for the music they download? Could you do it legally? So they didn't really need to develop the iPod, they just needed to develop iTunes to test that model. Now that isn't actually how it happened, but it makes for a great story. <laughs> and uh, so can you take off an order of magnitude out of the cost by finding some way of getting the key risk done uh, you know, through an academic partnership. And I'll add to that, actually. I mean, for me, the key is to make sure you have a plan that identifies those key risks, those killer experiments, put your small amounts of money, which you can, I think, you know, it's hard, but go for grants. <laughs> go for things like, you know, Stanford Spark, Catalyst. Everyone has these. These is non-dilutive funding and put your money on the key risks. Just make sure you identify the right ones uh, to put your money on. So um, I, really agree, I, I really agree with the disaggregation comment said earlier. And quite frankly, I'm like always a little bit surprised on why that's taking so long, because um, it seems extremely obvious. But why do you think it's taking so long? Like, why is it still, you know, in Boston, if you want to get one little room in a fume hood, you have to drive out two hours out to Worcester or somewhere else? Well, Lab Central solving that problem. But the, you know, it's interesting. It's come on slowly, but the impact to the industry of uh, Wuxi Aptech and of uh, uh, Chem Partners and companies like that, of uh, CROs that can do preclinical animal work as well as any pharmaceutical company, is something we take for granted. That's only 10 or 15 years old. Yeah. Percy, do you want to comment on that? Because <laughs> uh, a lot of, if you look at Lilly, sold their preclinical animal testing unit and now contracts it out. And um, so it's, it's a really interesting time. I think one of the things that distinguishes what we try to do is our entrepreneurs are not MBAs. Our entrepreneurs are graduate students, postdocs, refugees from the biopharmaceutical industry who are themselves technical. And what they do, what they know how to do is reduce that technical risk. And so they don't want to outsource their med cam or their product development. The complementary preclinical testing maybe but uh, we want to empower that entrepreneurial scientist to do it themselves. <clears throat> Percy, does the BMS have any sort of incubator accelerator in any place in the system? Well, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so as, I, uh, as I mentioned, we've just become a, a sponsor of Lab Central. Right. I should be sponsoring another incubator as well. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a relatively new part of our strategy. Uh, we have always, I think, we've always partnered with uh, companies on a you know strategic alignment basis. I, I should just comment in regards to the disaggregation question because it's a good one. I, I do think it's important to note that a lot of these resources were built with pharma in mind and not necessarily biotech yeah, in mind. Point. Right. So if you look at a lot of the ways the CROs were developed, they were developed with the idea of actually mm -hmm. us as their customer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think um, so if you look at Lab Central or if you look at what QB3 is, has done, this concept of atomizing the research right down yeah. to the level of, you know, this bench, right, um, that's still a relatively new concept. And so yeah. for the CROs, I think what it comes down to is how are they going to make money at that, at that concept, mm -hmm. right? And so, I, you know, it's, but it's coming. I mean, there's no doubt that it's, it's a process that's happening. That's a really good point because the transaction cost to get that chemistry project exactly. done with Wuxi yeah is six months or whatever, three months anyway, and uh, a big company can endure that, a startup can. So my question is more uh, regarding uh, the IP for, let's say, platform technology. So let's assume you have a platform technology and we go to the licensing office and we have uh, five claims which come out of it and you spin a co company out of it and then let's say down the line you have a few more claims which come out. Uh, so at that stage, uh, 
is it good to come back uh, through the uh, you know academic uh, route or as a company you just go ahead and, and file your IP uh, around those new claims? Uh, it, it's a little bit of a contentious issue because sometimes uh, the primary you know uh, holder might be connected to the university. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts and advice regarding that. I'm gonna paraphrase the questions, make sure everyone heard it. I think um, basically the question is about improvement IP that um, maybe a company has, has made some improvements, maybe discovered new compounds, et cetera. <clears throat> I think every university might have a different view. I'm not sure whether we see everything the same. From our perspective, we think it's smart for the licensee, the startup company, to build their own patent portfolio. You'll have the base patent from us, the platform, let's say exclusively, and then you build off of that. Some of the universities might want something back um, sort of, we call it a reach through, but um, many universities won't. Um, I thought the question about the, or the point about the value inflection points was, uh, was interesting, but can you uh, talk about frameworks any of you might have for identifying those and if there are competing views about which one ought to be pursued next, uh, how to go about prioritizing and resolving those? I think all three of us said the same thing in different contexts. So this is where the TPP and the key experiments are just other ways of saying the same thing. But it's, I, so Brooke Byers, our preeminent life science venture capitalist, always came here, it comes here and gives talks and he says, I want people to focus on the white hot risk. I used to think, well, geez, that's like saying, take your task list, put the most important stuff at the top, and only do that. We all know that. None of us do it, right? But, and it finally <laughs> occurred to me that, no, it's really hard to know what that singular risk is, that it's iTunes and not the box. And so we think that the way to do that is by doing essentially a lean, but a focused on the technical issues, with the future customers, with investors, and with smart people in the ecosystem. It takes a lot of work to figure out what that singular risk is. So, so one thing we, we, um, that, that this Lean Startup Framework can help with <coughs> is you go out and talk to people like Percy in the beginning, before you have anything, and you say, all right, what, what would you need to see? Um, what would make this interesting to you? And just understand, farm is going to be your customer. You might as well understand what they need before you go to the lab at all. And then focus directly on, on the, the pathway that pharma, the customer, has laid out for you. I don't know, Percy, would, would, does that make sense for you? If you're the buyer. Yeah, it does. Um, it does make sense to talk to us early. Um, and. Uh, one thing, I, or actually to your friendly venture capitalist who has actually also a very good sense. So venture capitalists have a very keen sense of the question that's on the table. Um, what I would say just in addition to that is um, it's really important to think about these experiments at a very high level of detail, right, to make sure that when you ask the question, the question has been asked properly. So let's just take, for example, the most basic idea of uh, even a phase one clinical trial or a phase two proof of concept trial. If you bring a molecule into that, into that trial, into that human study, uh, that doesn't have the appropriate pharmacokinetic you know, um, characteristics, the appropriate potency, the appropriate receptor off rate, et cetera, there's any number of ways, right, or your capped and dose because of some toxicology, et cetera, you're not, gonna, you're not asking the question. You're not actually running the key experiment. Right, so it's really important to think about the mechanics of what needs to be done. And I think Matthew brought up a great point yesterday in terms of sometimes it's, it's actually better to run a couple really well-designed experiments in serial such that you're building to, you know, the point where you're holding it by the jugular vein, right? So I think it's important to think through that. I think we're all saying it, but when it comes down to it, make sure you've talked to a lot of people in detail so that you can really identify them risks. A lot of people that have been there and done something similar. That's my advice, and, and you can find these people. There's lots in the room. So um, to follow on on the platform licensing question, I've heard that universities are allergic to sub-licenses effectively, and I'm wondering if that's... I understand how that could be true for the first moment when you're licensing the technology, maybe, but I don't understand how it could be true after you've demonstrated value of the platform and then you're monetizing 
the portfolio? No, I think that's one of those myths because um, if you give an exclusive license, you have to allow them to sublicense or else nothing happens to it, right? So, and we know with biotech, they're going to sublicense to pharma if not <laughs> be acquired. So we certainly know that. One of the things that we don't want to lose track of is sublicensing who then sublicenses and who then sublicenses because it's just hard for everybody to keep track of everything. So that, you know, typically we allow one level of sublicensing. And if you talk about it with us and there's some reason to allow the next level, we would. But with in vivo trials, um, because of ethics considerations, you're not, you shouldn't do just one experiment on an animal when you can do three. So when studying, when doing therapeutics, do you have any recommendations for which experiments you should do? So like the eff efficacy and then send the organs out or what would you recommend in order to save okay. animal lives? Right, yeah, I think a very good point. Of course, uh, the truth is that as you go through the process, there's different killer experiments. The question is, what's your next one? Um, if you have a new therapeutic with a novel target, your first question is efficacy. But I would suggest to you, from my history, that most animal models don't really predict efficacy. So, so be careful how you set that experiment up. You think about it hard. And the other thing that I would really strongly advise, and technically academics often don't think about this, is compare it in that same experiment with the competitor compound, the gold standard compound. This makes it a very powerful uh, question to ask. But of course, the next question is, actually, is actually, I can have the effect I want, but is it safe? And of course, you'll never really know that till you get to the clinic. But if you can answer, you can pre try and predict and try and answer some questions on that, that should be your next question. But very carefully design that question. Robust um, experiments are really important too. Um, reproducibility is an issue and needs to be considered in this process. So think hard. Thank you, everyone.